Today I have the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Mount from Real Intelligence. Is that correct, Jeff? Yes, Tracy. Thanks. Nice to see you. Well, I have to tell you, it's rare in my life. I think this may have been one of the, uh, the best written news releases I've ever seen. Uh, did you write this yourself, Jeff, or did you hire someone to do this? A uh, combination. Yeah, a little bit of it was mine, and there was contribution, uh, contrib contributions from our PR team. And for those of you out there that did not have the pleasure of having this come across your desk, listen to this. It says, industry leaders such as Blockbuster, Toys R Us, Borders and Pan Am all ignored warnings to pivot and quickly failed to exit. Real intelligence and authority on the dynamic American financial landscape warns against behaviors that will lead uneducated and undertrained financial advisors into irrelevancy as artificial intelligence rises. So how about we just start right there. Uh, what gives you the know-how to put that kind of very powerful news release out to the rest of us? So we are seeing massive industry consolidation. We are certainly seeing the rise of artificial intelligence uh, as it relates to trading, financial planning. Uh, and of course, we have robo-advisors, which have very quickly uh, risen to compete in terms of assets under management with even the insurance companies and uh, bank brokerages. Uh, I don't know that they'll ever take, take over the big wirehouses, but they certainly have done a very impressive job in terms of growth and assets under management with those smaller accounts. I was recently at a, a group of investors. They had a, a room full of computers. They were explaining how 60% uh, of everybody who enters the uh, uh, day trading loses all their money because they make decisions based on emotions and the benefit of this artificial intelligence. It, is this true? I mean, you know, I can certainly look at my own portfolio and see some validity to their argument. It could be. I mean, time will tell. I know last year there, I saw an article about uh, SRI, socially responsible investing, uh, on a robo-based uh, format versus what advisors have been doing, and the robos won. But again, that was just one year. We will see over time how that actually plays out. But yes, AI definitely is going to be challenging to compete against. I think socially responsible investing by our robo-investors would definitely be down around, uh, I don't know, our 10th episode, if we can even get our heads around this. So uh, help me understand this. I mean, I know, you know, 10 years ago when we were walking in, in as investment bankers and they were telling us how our analysts, you know, there was a Chinese wall, and we realized that it wasn't going to take long before these senior analysts weren't going to have a job because they couldn't fight to hold on to these top brains. and and intellectual abilities, you know, I, I know we, we, we hunt them. We hunt for these, these brains. Can you tell me, though, how this uh, artificial intelligence is going to replace our brains, our experience? It's going to replace our brains, but there's no question it can do math far faster than any of us. Um, is it going to understand the human condition better than us? No. And that's where I think uh, human-centered financial planning uh, is going to be valued by those people who have the most at risk. Okay, well, we don't want to miss out on this. What do we do? I noticed <laughs> your uh, your website basically says, you know, it's it's kind of, I'd like to recommend more people uh, check out your, your LinkedIn for sure. I mean, it sounds like you take us, you know, sad, depressed, middle-class millionaires and help us become, what, happy middle-class millionaires? Or what's really the goal here? I'm actually quite curious. I, I found the marketing quite entertaining, quite frankly. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. So the objective here is to help the middle-class millionaire feel more confident uh, about matching up their assets versus their liabilities, have a clear understanding as to what they can and cannot do, and know that there is a human-centric uh, financial planner who is behind this to make sure that the strategic thought that comes out of the plan can be applied very quickly and very easily. Okay, well, we know how this game works. We we hire ourselves an in, you know investment manager, investment advisor. Forgive me, get the get the terms right. Or I'll get a lot of emails. We go out for lunch. They tell us how they're taking care of us, and we both know those aren't the brains making the decisions. And you know, when we sign up with company A, we're we're pretty much committed to all the tools and instruments sold by that company, but we're restricted by it. Is this going to provide us with more options in the future? 
I think what it's going to do is, number one, offer a little bit more certainty as it relates to risk management because our process of managing risk is less to do with the old institutional way, which, of course, is to do the risk profile questionnaire and rebalance systematically. We don't believe in that at all. Instead, we believe in aging of portfolios. And we need to separate the portfolios on a purpose base purpose basis, if you will, whether it's college tuition planning, whether it's retirement, capitalizing a small business in the future, the actual aging of the portfolio will be managed to the distribution date. The advisor then has to deliver an experience that is going to deliver three sets of value propositions that will be valued by the investor. And those value propositions look and sound an awful lot like what you would expect from a family office client service model, which, of course, is generally reserved for very, very wealthy people. But we generally bring that to people who are in that middle class millionaire uh, time frame. So those three value propositions are preservation of wealth in multiple ways. Obviously, we have an eye on investment risk, but also managing taxes and managing the possibility of frivolous and fraudulent lawsuits. Secondly, restore their time to focus on family and their profession, and last but not least, a high degree of privacy and discretion. Well, I don't want to offend you here, but, you know, frankly, you look like a middle-class millionaire. How are you finding out and breaking in, creaking this door open into these multi-generational wealthy family secrets that the rest of us would like to know about? I, I noticed your, uh, your, uh, your company says you're going to provide us with growth, maintenance, and exit. And I know there's many people, many of my peers, that love all three of those terms. And depending on where we are, you know, our enthusiasm. So the, the growth, maintain, and exit really is aimed at the advisor, not the actual investor. Different message for a different group of people. But as far as the family office format goes, I happen to live in Fairfield County, Connecticut, which is a very, very wealthy suburb of New York City, surrounded by traditional family offices. Uh, I'm heavily exposed to what the actual experience is like. And uh, quite frankly, we're at an age now where even the things that used to be unaccessible for the middle class millionaire really are becoming accessible, like private equity investing through mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, just putting together the model requires some legwork from the advisor. Okay, well, I'm just imagining you, you right now sitting in Connecticut with your martini eavesdropping to the guy sitting next to you and taking notes, almost the, the Robin Hood for the the middle class millionaires. Uh, anyways, we'd love to have you back again. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm absolutely certain our audience will enjoy this. Thank you, Tracy.